alien spaceship or cute little sea friend. This is a comb jelly or a tinafore. And unlike regular jellyfish, these guys can put on a scintillating light show using a combination of bioluminescence and optics. Bioluminescence is the process where organisms produce their own light. On land, sunlight is plentiful, and few organisms bother expending energy to create their own light. But in the darkness of the sea, making your own light can really be worthwhile, since it can be a good way to signal for mates, attract food, or confuse predators. And so bioluminescence is believed to have evolved at least 84 times independently. The word bioluminescence has interesting origins. It comes from Greek bios, meaning life, plus Latin lumen, meaning light. And bios is believed to trace back to the Proto-Indo-European root guai, meaning to live. And although sound changes make it tough to hear, this root has a ton of descendants that still relate to the concept of life, including the words quick, vivid, and zoology. Meanwhile, lumen has its root in Proto-Indo-European luk, which meant light or bright, and is related to modern words lunar and luster, as well as the English word light itself. The basic principle of bioluminescence works like this. Two components come together, causing a chemical reaction that emits energy in the form of light. So the components are commonly called luciferin, which is the energy storing compound that will emit the light, and luciferase, which is an enzyme that catalyzes the reaction. And both words come from the Latin word lucifer, meaning light bringer, and that word also comes from the same root as luminescence. So for the Romans, Lucifer meant the planet Venus, and eventually became associated with a prideful devil in Christianity. The tinafor Baroe abyssicola, or the abyssal comb jelly, uses a luciferin called selenterazine and another chemical called a photoprotein that fills the role of the luciferase. And I'll briefly go through the chemical reaction that this animal uses to make light. So the photoprotein catalyzes an oxidation reaction on the selenterazine and creates a complex that's sensitive to calcium ions. Next, calcium ions join the complex and cause a second reaction. And this is where blue light gets released along with carbon dioxide. There's also some evidence that tinafores have relatives of the green fluorescent protein in their genomes, which would in principle allow them to convert blue light into green light. But the tinafore version of these proteins has a pretty different sequence from the canonical green fluorescent protein, so it's also possible that they serve a different function and are not fluorescent. Regardless, from some boring chemicals, tinafores make light. It's not just comb jellies that use selenterazine. And actually, this chemical was originally discovered in the bodies of jellyfish and coral, which were formerly placed in the phylum selenterata. And that's the origin of the word selenterazine the selenterate chemical. Comb jellies also used to be considered selenterates, but that word isn't really used these days, and I'll explain why. So selenterata comes from the Greek root koilos, meaning empty, plus enteron, meaning gut. And the selenterates were defined by possessing an organ called a selenteron, which is a single body cavity with one entrance or exit that's also called a gastrovascular cavity because it functions both to digest food and also to transport nutrients throughout the body. So both regular jellyfish and comb jellies look pretty similar, and they both have a selenteron, but recent genomic analyses support the idea that comb jellies are actually only very distantly related to jellyfish. So distant, in fact, that tinafores are not only their own independent phylum, but actually the first group of animals to split off from all the others several hundred million years ago. So actually, humans, jellyfish, and even sea sponges are closer relatives to one another than the comb jellies are to any of us. And nowadays, jellyfish are placed within phylum Cnidaria, along with corals, while comb jellies make up phylum Tinophora, and both words come from Greek. Cnidaria comes from knidi, meaning nettle, because of the stinging cells that jellyfish and corals have, while tinophore comes from the Greek root Ketin, meaning comb, plus fora, meaning bearer, and that refers to the colorful beading comb rows they have on their body. Another wrinkle is that although selenterazine is found in many animals, a lot of them get it from eating other creatures that are actually producing their own selenterazine and actually can't make of it any of it on their own. But tinafores actually can make their own. 
and probably donate some to other critters when they end up as food. So how do comb jellies make so many colors? It turns out it's because their bodies not only produce light, but also reflect it in captivating ways. So the colorful part of the tinafore are the combs on their body, which are covered in cilia, which are tiny tail-like structures that come out of cells. So cilia is actually the Latin word for eyelash. And in the species Barroe cucumis, thousands of tinafore cilia on the combs are packed tightly together in a regular pattern, and together they have the properties of what's called a photonic crystal. So the cilia and the photonic crystal are transparent to some frequencies of light, but reflect other frequencies. And that's normal, that's basically the same thing as a tinted window. But what makes the crystal so colorful is that as light hits it at different angles, the wavelengths of light that it reflects versus transmit through it actually change. So if you look at it straight on, you see one color reflected back at your eye, but if you look at it at a 45 degree angle, you're gonna see a different color. And this property is called iridescence, and a bunch of animals have it, including some birds, butterflies, and beetles. And the special thing about tinafore combs is that they are moving, because comb jellies actually swim by beating their cilia back and forth. So as the cilia move, we see them at different angles, and so we see the colors change again and again, scintillating, mesmerizing. Of course, the reason it looks this way is because we are looking at tinafores under white light, which is reflected back at us, and white light contains many frequencies. So that's why we see the iridescence, because depending on the angle, different components of the white light are getting reflected back into our eye. So how does this iridescence interact with the comb jelly's bioluminescence, which is generally just at a single frequency? What do they look like in the deep, dark ocean where there's no natural light, but just their bioluminescence? So with only one frequency, there won't be any iridescence. I found this photo of a tinafore that was taken in the dark, and you can only see the teal-colored bioluminescence. So depending on the angle of the cilia, different amounts of the light will get transmitted through or reflected back. So it will actually still shimmer, but only in a single color, the bioluminescent color. The word iridescent comes to English from Latin iris, which meant the colored part of the eye as well as a rainbow. And that word comes from Greek, where iris was actually a person. She was the messenger of the gods and the rainbow was her sign. And again, the purpose of all this bioluminescence, this shimmering, this reflectance, and iridescence is probably either to confuse predators or to attract food or mates. While researching this video, I learned that some tinafore species, like the Venus girdle, can grow more than a meter long. And so it's a good thing that I live on the land and they live in the water, because I've been put under their spell, and otherwise I'd probably get eaten.